All right, good evening. I'm Susan Kreischer, Associate Director of Alumni Relations. Welcome to Making a Difference from the Headwaters of the Susquehanna to the Chesapeake Bay with Trent Millam, Savannah Rhodes, and Matt Wilson. They'll discuss the critical role that the Susquehanna River watershed plays on the health of the Chesapeake Bay. Additionally, they will describe the active role that the Freshwater Research Institute is taking to improve the health of the bay through watershed research and stream restoration. Matt will kick off the discussion in just a minute, but first I wanna let you know that this session is being recorded and I wanna welcome several SU faculty and staff who are attending tonight's event, including Melissa Kumora, Vice President for Advancement. Also joining us from the Advancement team are Chris Markle and Michelle Sears. If you have questions tonight, please submit them in the Q&A and we'll do our best to answer all of the questions by the end of the session. Tonight's moderator is Matt Wilson, Program Director of Susquehanna University's Freshwater Research Institute, or FRI, and Adjunct Faculty in Earth and Environmental Sciences. Matt is a stream and restoration ecologist focused on understanding the processes that drive patterns we see in nature and how to mimic these processes in restoration. In addition to running the FRI, he teaches restoration ecology and aquatic entomology. Matt? Thanks, Susan. Um, so welcome, everyone. And first, I'll start off by saying welcome, Trent and Savannah. I'm excited to see both of you here tonight. Uh, so Trent graduated from Susquehanna in 2020 with an Earth and Environmental Sciences and Religion double major. Um, and he's currently an AmeriCorps member with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, which finds its way a little bit further east than you might think for the name. Um, as a student at SU, he was an orientation leader, undergrad research assistant, student ambassador, lab teaching assistant, and that just is the start of a long list. So excited to have Trent here. Um, Savannah graduated in 2018 with a degree in ecology. She is currently a special Chesapeake Bay specialist with Union County Conservation District, just north of us. Uh, her experience includes environmental internships uh, with Susquehanna Basin River Commission, SRBC, um, Green Thumb Industries, and working as a utility forester for environmental consultants. So I wanna start off uh, just with a little bit of background and asking both of you um, about your experience working at the Fry. I was gonna start with Trent, but this looks like a great reason to start with Savannah. Um, so sounds good. So uh, just to give a brief background of myself. So I actually was originally a marine biology major. I grew up in Seals Grove, so I wanted to get far away from Susquehanna. Um, so I actually was in St. Petersburg, Florida my freshman year uh, as a marine biology major. So I was doing something completely different, but when I got home for the summer of my freshman year, I actually reached out to Jonathan Niles, who was the director of the Fry at the time and was able to get an internship, even though I was not with the university. So I would say that was probably my eye-opening point where I realized how much was just in my backyard. Um, the Freshwater Research Initiative at that time was very new. So it was something that was very exciting. A lot of the faculty and I interacted based on my internships. So then from there, um, my sophomore year of college, I actually decided to switch to ecology and transfer to Susquehanna University um, just to have a more general undergraduate background and have more experience because I knew I could kind of start my research. So um, my sophomore year at the Fry, I actually worked with a PhD student named Shannon White. Um, we did a telemetry study on brook trout, so we tagged um, with a tracker 150 brook trout. You can see in the images on the screen, we would electrofish, catch the fish, and then do a small surgical incision in the stomach where we would thread an antenna out the side of them. So we would actually track their movement. It was a multi-season study, so I was there throughout the summer. Um, we collected blood and gill samples and actually did genetic studies on the isolated populations. And then my junior year, that actually led me into my own research. 
Um, my freshman year, I was kind of working with another senior at the time on her capstone project, researching invasive crayfish um, diets. So we were kind of looking at that. And then when I went into my research, I was actually studying uh, brook and brown trout um, interspecific competition where I was doing studies in runway tanks. So that was really exciting at the fry to get those tanks set up. Um, and then preceding um, graduation, I actually worked at the Susquehanna River Basin Commission for a period. And um, I would say my most related work after that was now in my current position where I'm a Chesapeake Bay specialist, doing farm inspections, making sure that uh, farm owners are up to date on their plans. So they need an agricultural erosion and sedimentation plan, as well as a manure management plan if that's applicable to their property. And in these inspections, if we notice any issues uh, with their property, we try to get some kind of funding to do manure storage systems or re plant repairing buffers, which you can see in some of the images. So we've been trying to do a lot of work with landowners in the area. Thanks. So same question to you, Trent. So uh, I started out my first year and I was an earth and environmental sciences major. So I came in as that in college. And uh, my goal honestly was just try and find some kind of position for that first summer after college, um, whether that was research, internship or something like that. And the opportunity popped up with the Freshwater Research Initiative. And so I applied and got one of the positions. That was the summer, I believe, Savannah, you were doing the runway tanks um, that I hopped on with the fry. And my role, um, these pictures that are scrolling on this on the slide right now are actually for my current job, but a lot of the work actually is, is pretty much the same. So um, with the fry, I, I was able to help out with pretty much the four main um, fish research projects going on at the time or biological research projects. Um, the Unassessed Waters Program, which is sponsored by the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, um, and it's all about surveying streams in Pennsylvania that don't have existing uh, fish population data. So trying to gather that information, hoping to find wild trout populations, which would then qualify those streams for greater protection and provide more um, information for anglers as well in the state. Um, at the time, they were also, the Fry was surveying long-term sites in the Loyal Sox State Forest. Um, collecting information uh, based on the pre and post like 2011 flood data. So um, I was helping out with that project. We also had several farm streams that were being looked at. Um, and that was mainly fish and macroinvertebrate data as well. And then precision conservation streams, which were sites where either restoration had already been done or was going to be done in the near future. Um, so collecting data before and after those restoration structures get put in to see how they're impacting the biological community. And so for all four of these projects, um, it was the same type of work. It was electrofishing um, for fish populate, population data and also collecting macroinvertebrates. Um, I distinctly remember a lot of rainy days that summer. And when there were rainy days, I was in the lab looking at bugs and under a microscope. So um, doing a lot of um, bug sorting and identification as well. So for me, this was kind of a jumping off point. I got a ton of experience um, right away. This was after my first year, which I remember being really shocked at that, um, just because a lot of places you don't get an opportunity to do that kind of stuff that early on in your college tenure. Um, so I was able to get a lot of experience. Uh, I was out in the field a lot, which is what I love to, to do. I love to be outside working in the field. Um, I got to work with a lot of different people, including Savannah that summer. And that kind of jumped me into the following two years. Um, I, I started doing a, more of an independent research project through the Earth and Environmental Sciences Department, um, looking at the water quality of, late, of two different lakes um, that had small dams on them and looking at lake stratification and how the temperature changes at different layers of the lake throughout the summer. Um, and so my time at the Fry really kind of jump-started me and it has now come full circle as I'm working on some of the same projects now with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, including the Unassessed Waters Program and a lot of the sampling methods I first learned that first summer have kind of come into play as well with what I'm doing now. Thanks, Trent. It's funny watching those photos go through um, while you were talking and, and trying to decide a couple of times whether or not 
the photo was from while you were at the Fry or while it was with Western PA Conservancy. Um, and uh, the, the sort of complete circle you'd made, especially when I walked into a meeting at the beginning of this summer and saw you across the table and had no idea you were going to be there, you know, like yeah. to go into an unassessed waters training and say, oh, look who's here. Um, and then, you know, climb out of a stream and Savannah was standing there, um, wondering who the crazy person was crawling through brush with a backpack shocker on. In a very small trickling stream. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's been wonderful to, you know, without expecting it, seeing both of you not in a, you know, out in the field, in your element that's also my element too, and like how well you've enjoyed it and, and embraced it. Um, for me, that's just been really fun. Uh, but what I wanted to you know, start thinking about a little bit is how, so you know, you've both, you started the fight, you had some fantastic experiences while you were at SU. Um, and then you went off and did lots of, you continued to do really interesting things. You got to work with other organizations, see how they do things. Um, and you know, thinking about how, that has led you to where you are now and what you're learning. So you know, in your case, Savannah, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on you a little bit because you're right next door. Um, but you know, how has that sort of prepared you and made you think about or even reflect on the differences in working with a conservation district and, and how you sort of work with landowners versus you know, when you were a student just going onto the farms to sample, right? Yeah, so I would say it didn't really prepare you for what it was going to be like in the real world. Like your internships definitely expose you to different things like the unassessed waters. I would help with that occasionally. Um, and then I would say like a lot of my work was like research based, working with the PhD student on her thesis and then also working in my project. So it was kind of more independent research versus going out in the field um, like some of the other Fry interns would do where they're doing the unassessed waters and they do sometimes have to interact with landowners. So to be honest, I wasn't totally prepared for that. Um, I'm lucky that I waitressed, so I've dealt with a decent amount of people. Um, so that kind of just exposed me. And I think the other good thing is I did grow up in this area. So I kind of have that relative experience of being in the area, which I think is something that's important. When people have something to relate to you, it makes it a lot easier to suggest planting a riparian buffer. You're not just some outsider kind of walking onto a landowner's property telling them what they're doing wrong. So I think really listening to people and making sure that you're emphasizing that you're there to help is super important because a lot of people will get an inspection letter from me and they assume that I'm going to go out there and enforce all these regulations and yell at them for what they're doing. But in reality, we're just trying to help them toward working towards compliance, um, doing outreach events to inform them of financial resources that we have based on our partnerships. So um, and also the good thing that I loved about Susquehanna was that we had, you know, different Chesapeake Conservancy is right on campus that was super helpful for me um just having the riparian buffer kind of background it started when I was there and now it's really expanded so I would say the partnerships have been substantial in funding um working together it just seems like everybody ends up running into each other if you're in this field which is really awesome um so it took a long time for me to get into the field where I wanted to be so I would even say for recent alumni that are kind of struggling to get into their field, don't give up. I I interviewed at Union County Conservation District alone four times. So if you're passionate about what you want to do, just keep connecting with people out in the field. Um, if there's volunteer 
areas where you can help out specifically with Union County who have the Riparian Ranger program now where we're working with Buffalo Creek Watershed Alliance. So it's just tons of partnerships to get people out in the field to do the work that's necessary. And if you're passionate about it, don't give up. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I think one of the things that you just mentioned that I was going back to is the uh, that verification process on or inspection process on farms, right? Just in the meeting we were both in last, yes, last week. Um, yes. I was talking to somebody and saying, I wish we had a different word for inspection, you know, because that initially that just immediately gives the connotation you're coming out to find what's wrong instead of help make it right, you know. I agree. And then especially if DEP is sending out that letter, then it, it adds a whole other level of intensity. So yeah. I just try to explain to landowners working with the good guys that the lower level conservation districts a lot better than when we actually have to do enforcement and refer them to DEP. So I always just try to say we're here to help. And that's all I can say. <laughs> yeah. So Trent, I'm guessing you have maybe some similar, but some some different interactions too, working with people because you know you were at a nonprofit in New Hampshire and now in another nonprofit in PA coming back. You know, how does your interaction, your um, sort of transitioning to nonprofit from SU, uh, like what lessons I think guests have you learned? Yeah, I think similar to Savannah, um, you know, you can learn a lot from classes and doing some of the undergraduate research. You don't get as much of the communication aspect in there um, as you do when you get out into the field. Um, but I mean, almost immediately working in environmental nonprofit work, it's you, you learn right away that communication is literally everything. Um, you're, you're never doing a project on your own, whether it's as an individual or even just as your own organization, you're almost always working with somebody else. Um, you need to receive the funding from somewhere else typically. So a lot of different interactions. When I was in New Hampshire, it was a, a small watershed wide organization. Um, and so we really focused on just one watershed, six different towns in one county. Um, and so a lot of my interaction there was either the local town governments and municipalities, um, working with them, talking to the, the different conservation districts. Um, each of the towns up there had a conservation district and also working a lot with volunteers because um, a lot of our, our watershed programs were all volunteer based. Uh, we only had four staff people and a couple of AmeriCorps members. And so we can't do all of the work that we were doing without the volunteers that help us every day. So. Um, a lot of my role was was volunteer organization, volunteer communication, um, getting to know the volunteers, going out into the field with them, helping to train them. Um, so there's also that sort of internal interaction. And then coming back to work with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy was a bit of a change because it's a much larger nonprofit organization than the one I was working for. Instead of it being one county or one watershed focus it's basically the entire state of Pennsylvania obviously focused on the western half so um, it's a lot more interaction um, all of our projects have partners and it's it's really awesome to be out in the field one week we'll be out we'll be up in the Allegheny National Forest and we've got people from the Forest Service working with us and then the next week we're down near Pittsburgh and we have um, the Washington County Conservation District out working with us and so um, we are kind of the drivers of a lot of the projects in this area. And a lot of times um, there's another organization that's applied for funding to do some research work in their area, or we've applied for funding and we um, locate or pick out the groups that are in that specific area so that we can work with them. So um, it's pretty much everywhere in this field it's uh, we, we can't really do any of the projects we do without the communication and the collaboration. And I will say one thing I feel like I took from SU, which I'll give you a shout out here, Matt, for your restoration ecology class, um, is that you have to learn how to communicate with the people you're talking to based on what their values are and on their level. So um, we as conservationists have the value of just, you know, the environmental value, the conservation value, the things that we're trying to do 
we just inherently see as beneficial because it's beneficial for the environment. Um, someone else may have a much different angle of looking at it. Um, a farmer who has property is trying to also figure out, is this riparian buffer going to take away from some of my, you know, farmland? So how, how can you speak to that person and what their values are um, and the way that they make a living so that they are also just as interested while also speaking to the environmental values? So being able to work with different stakeholders from different um, fields and backgrounds is ultra important. Could not agree more. I'm glad you learned something in that class. <laughs> um, so we, we just had a couple of questions come in that I think are really relevant to what we've been talking about. Uh, one, I want to cover quickly about you know, what are some of the ways a riparian buffer can benefit a landowner? And you know, for me, I immediately think about what it does for the stream. I immediately think about you know, how it improves water quality, how it reduces sediment and improves nutrient retention. But I'm an ecologist, so you know, stepping away from that right and thinking about it as what's it do for the landowner? Um, I don't know if you have, Trent, but have you, Savannah, worked with any um, uh, multifunctional buffers at Union County? I haven't really seen many of them, but I know like, especially the 10 million tree program with Pennsylvania, they do, especially if you're closer to the bay and you kind of have like priority um, in that area on what you can order. A lot of the stuff that's on there is cranberry, raspberries, um, everything that we couldn't get, unfortunately, because we're <laughs> higher up kind of in that bay system. So, um, but I have seen a lot on multifunction. So even just like fruit trees, at least it's a tree, something near the stream that people, it's kind of an easier seller, especially for farmers, because they do want to farm up right to that edge. They don't want to lose out on the land and any income that they can get, especially in years like this, where there's a drought and they have to deal with all those issues and prices of seed and everything is going up. So multifunctional buffers are definitely something that I think we're going to have to work on even more. We do have a tree sale. Um, so a lot of, I think, conservation districts in our area do tree sales to just raise some money for the conservation district. So that's something we were actually already talking about. Maybe it would be worth spending an extra few dollars on the tree sale just to kind of get fruit trees and stuff that people are going to be more interested in when it is taking up a lot of their land. And the other thing is buffers are pretty messy looking if there's not maintenance there. So Luckily, recently, it seems like a lot of the grants that are being written for buffers, they'll actually put three years of maintenance in there that'll help out with selling these to landowners because then they know they don't have to do quite as much work. Um, so yeah, I think multifunctional buffers is definitely one of the major benefits, especially to farmers when it's taking up so much of their land. And even if it is just a small buffer with one line of trees, it's better than nothing. So any progress is progress. Yeah, I agree. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, what we're talking about with a multifunctional buffer is a uh, row of trees or several rows of trees along a stream that are fruit and nut producing trees or have some other type of economic value. So for us actually at the SEER, uh, Center for Environmental Education and Research at SU, right next to the FRI, we like our acronyms. Uh, we have a small spring that we planted two years ago as a demonstration buffer for multifunctional. So we put, we intended to put hickories, but this was you know, the spring of COVID and we had lots of supply issues. Um, so there's uh, maples in there, um, plum trees. Uh, you know, we, we did our best to get as many natives as we could. We tried a few pawpaws, they didn't take very well, but we'll probably get those back in once the canopy closes in a little. So, you know, if we can get trees that, that make up some of the losses based on agriculture removed from, or land removed from agriculture by putting trees there that create an economic offset, then everybody wins. And that's the goal of these buffers. So getting all the way back to that question about how do they benefit the landowner. Um, I will say we did get pawpaws, plum, and persimmon this year. So we did get some just to kind of sell those. <laughs> Lovely. There we go. <laughs> just got one before uh, the webinar tonight. Um, awesome. 
And so that's going to be for lunch tomorrow. But uh, <laughs> this next question ties into a question that I was going to ask right after that. And it was directed at you, Savannah, for what if you could talk a little bit more about uh, the buffers on Buffalo Creek. But where I was going to take this next too is, you know, I suspect as amazing as it is hearing about both of your uh, career journey so far, um, some of our viewers might want to know a little bit more about what they can do. You know, how can they help? How can they can improve water quality? Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll throw the little Buffalo Creek plug in there, but also if you could speak a little bit about you know, what do you think somebody who is watching this tonight should do or could do to help out? Trent, do you want to go or me? Uh, yeah, I can, I can start. Um, this is something we could probably talk about for hours. So, um, you know, I'm sure that we'll have stuff to add to, but I think there's, you know, the easiest thing to do is, you know, especially if you own property is just, I would, you know, first just go out and I mean, I'm sure if you, many of you already know your property well, but go out and take a look at your property and, you know, what, what does it look like? Um, are there streams nearby, especially that's something I would keep in mind and something that I've been, haven't worked directly with, but have been very interested in for the last few years is the idea of lawn conversion, um, which is converting all or part of your grass lawn to either a meadow or pollinator plants, trees, shrubs, um, creating more habitat and diversity on your property. Um, and this can be beneficial in a lot of ways and not only will provide habitat that a monoculture lawn doesn't provide, um, whether that's for birds or insects or um, anything else, but it will also reduce the amount you actually have to maintain and take care of a lawn. Um, and you may, you know, again, all these things come with a price tag. And so we like to try and speak to where you can help to get money for this. Um, I did see that the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay is, is currently implementing a new program that will cover the cost of lawn conversion projects um, if the landowner agrees to do some maintenance work on that. So um, similar to the riparian buffer program, there's ways you can get involved and partner with some of these organizations to do some of those projects. Um, but there's also small things you can do um, that, you know, the SEER is kind of a model for some of those things, um, whether that's just having a vegetable garden or composting your compostable food waste, um, having rain barrels, a rain garden, um, just different ways to preserve water and to make your property, um, you know, an enhancement to the water quality in the area. Um, and then we talked about volunteering. That's one of the big things I would say, again, like I worked for an organization where um, we had over 50 to 60 volunteers that were doing our projects every week. And it, you know, was, if we didn't have those volunteers, we literally would not have been able to do any of the work that we did. So um, you can easily Google just in the area you live in um, watershed organizations, and you'll probably come up, there'll probably be 12 to 15 things that come up because there's a lot of these watershed groups that um, need help. So I think, I mean, Savannah, you can probably speak a little bit more specifically to the Buffalo Creek stuff, but those are some of the, the immediate things that come to mind, just things you can do on your own property um, or ways to get involved and educate yourself so that you can be learning more while you're also helping some of these organizations out. Yeah. I'll, um, sorry, I'll piggyback on, on Trent real fast to add for the lawn conversion plug. Uh, two things. One is if Anybody who's out there interested in this Department of Natural Resources and Conservation, DCNR, Department of Conservation and Natural Resources, I got it backwards, but DCNR in Pennsylvania will help with lawn conversion projects as well. Um, we worked, Susquehanna worked with DCNR two years ago, um, actually to do a lawn conversion on campus. That was, I think, our first lab trend for restoration. So, you know, we, went out and looked at a site. It was actually President Green's idea. You know, what can we do with this lawn that no one uses? And so we've turned it into a meadow and are gonna start using it for classes as plants grow up and we can use them for identification. So um, DCNR is a great place to look as well for help with that. Yeah, I would say just to kind of touch on that um, in Lewisburg area, we've done a lot of work recently with uh, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. So I would say if you're more worried in an area where like banks are eroding, you're losing property, if you don't want to go totally riparian buffer and just kind of hope that that all works, 
Um, I would say contacting your conservation district. Um, there's usually a watershed specialist, I think, at almost every conservation district out there. Um, they usually work with, I know we work with uh, Pennsylvania uh, Cent North Central Conservancy a lot for funding. Um, and they have a few employees, but then also they kind of loop in Fish and Boat Commission where they're installing log veins and doing kind of more bank stabilization projects while in the stream. So it's it's a lot of money, it's a lot of work, but if you're concerned and say your neighbors are concerned as well and there's enough initiative to get some work done in the stream in your area, it's worth reaching out to the conservation district if people are willing to have the stream restored in that area. Because a lot of the projects we were doing this year, one was up in Allenwood um, in the state game lands. Um, so we were actually contacted by the game commission on for this project and we installed log veins and some tree structures. We went back the next couple of days and you already saw trout moving in and hiding underneath the log structures. So it's amazing how quick the restoration work actually benefits. And then we actually went up there and we seeded the banks and everything and we're planning on doing some buffer work. So if you're really worried about bank con conditions, stabilizing the bank and doing I guess more work, it's worth reaching out to conservation districts. Um, and we have the Buffalo Creek Watershed Alliance as well. So we get a lot of volunteers out of that. Um, and we're still kind of running this riparian ranger program, which was piloted this past summer. We do trainings with the Chesapeake Bay, um, I wanna say Conservancy. There's so many Chesapeake Bay Foundation. There's so many different programs. Um, but they actually will come out and do a training for the area. So we should be posting something um, on the Union County Conservation Facebook page of a training. So if you're wanting to get involved in the area, those trainings would be really helpful. And we kind of just go out and do maintenance um, whenever possible, replanting with a lot of the Pennsylvania 10 Million Trees program. So there's ways to get involved. I would just say reaching out and even following pages on Facebook um, is kind of a way to see what's going on going on in your area. Yeah, I think there are lots of opportunities out there. It's sometimes just difficult to decide where to start or even you know, figure out how to search for the opportunities. Those are great ideas, thanks. Um, something that we talked about a few weeks ago when we started you know, discussing what this might look like uh, was a question of why are there so many organizations that do this work? You know, somebody who isn't involved in it might look and see that there are five or six nonprofits doing things in Union County alone and wonder well, what the heck is going on. So you know, I think we all had some ideas and I would love to go back to that conversation and think, you know, for me, I think about the fact that we have the Chesapeake Conservancy directly on campus with us. And someone might think you know, we're a competitor because we're looking for grants to do research on restoration sites while well, they're looking for grants to monitor restoration sites. But actually the two marry each other really well and I think everybody benefits. So if you have thoughts on other groups or you know how that sort of ecosystem of nonprofits work, I'd love to hear them. Yeah, um, I think like, like a lot of things, it's all money driven um, and that's you know a huge aspect of it and what I mean by that is all of these organizations, especially the nonprofit ones, um, don't have a, you know, source of money to pull from to work on these projects. And so there are private foundations, there are governmental agencies, whoever it may be that these nonprofits are have, having to apply for grant funding to. Um, and so when they provide the funding, there's also then, do you have enough money for your staff to cover your staff time to go out and work on these projects? Do you have enough money to um, bring in a consultant or bring in another organization to do the work for you um, if you don't have the time or the money? So I think the numbers game is really important in conservation because, I mean, I haven't really ever seen it be a negative to just have more of these organizations working on the same things. You can go to the websites of six different land trusts in one, you know, one county, and they all seem like they're doing the same thing. Um, but in reality, it's just a cumulative effect. Um, and so what one organization can't cover with either the money, the lack of money they have or, or time or staff, 
another organization is kind of picking up and working on that as well. Um, and then when you get some of the larger organizations in that have been around for longer and do have more money, um, they're also typically partnered with all those smaller organizations. And so it's really a support system. Um, I've, I mean, I'm two years into this career now, but um, I've never seen it be, you know, a competition thing. It's always about how can we work with this person or this, this group is looking, is doing this work or this research. How can we jump in with that um, and be a part of it or, and make an even greater impact. So I guess that, that kind of speaks to the organization structure of, you know, all of these different groups. Yeah. Uh, just to kind of go off of that, I would say a lot of these agencies are working towards one common goal. It's to kind of do outreach, see what we can save in any way possible, work with landowners. And these grants kind of are so time consuming that if there's multi agencies and when we're awarded so much money, it's like, okay, now we need to get the ball rolling. We actually need to go out and use these funds. And it's hard work. I mean, no matter what, um, when you get down to it, it's not easy work. A lot of it needs to be done during the summer and super hot months. So I think just having those partnerships and being able to work with everyone together, everyone kind of knows that it might be a struggle that day um, just to kind of get the work done. But everybody wants to work towards that common goal of restoring any streams, rivers, and ultimately the bay in any way possible that I would say sometimes it's hard to get volunteers. And even with us, um, the a lot of the Buffalo Watershed Creek Alliance, um, they're retired. So they're older. We can't really expect them to work an eight hour day when it's 95 degrees outside. So I think um, just kind of having like a partnership where you know you might all struggle that day, but you're going to get the work done. And in the end, you feel fulfilled. I think that's a major thing that's been really important for me finding a position. I wanted to feel fulfilled in my job. So I think even volunteers, like when you actually go out and do this work and you see how quickly all of the things that you're doing impact the environment in a positive way, it's just so fulfilling and rewarding that you want to go back out there and do the same work. So I think it's just kind of the same group of people really enjoy that feeling and knowing that you're making progress in the right direction. From knowing a few of those uh, Buffalo Creek Watershed Association folks myself I, I think they'd still work an eight hour day i think they'd be happy about it they would uh, it's kind of insane i usually have to yell at them i'm like you need to drink water please relax like stop weed whacking we need to calm down <laughs> good to know they haven't changed in a decade uh -huh. yes not at all so uh, i want to I, I think both both of you just gave fantastic answers and it's really you know, i think nonprofits in the field of conservation work a lot like species do in an ecosystem. You know, higher biodiversity is a good thing. We interact with each other in positive ways. So I, I love the echoes you both had of each other on that. Um, we, we've talked a lot about how you, know, how you can help, how you can do things, um, what you've learned about being effective in that. We haven't really, you know, I'm, we sort of made a leap here that everyone who's watching this webinar is watching it because they care, right? They, they care about learning more about um, how to help and how to do that. But what if we back up a step here? I want to, maybe this will be our last question before we start taking more questions. Um, you know, if for the people who are watching tonight, um, how would you say to them, they should explain the value of you know, the small tributaries of the Susquehanna to Chesapeake Bay. Like, how, how do you get somebody out there to get excited about this who may not be otherwise and see the value? I can kind of touch base on that to start. Um, so when I go out and do an inspection and people are not caring where the manure is or what their banks look like or anything like that, I try to explain them, you know, upstream from you, if that person also isn't going to care about the quality of their stream, 
How are, how is the health of your animals going to be? How is your drinking water? There's so many things that impact people that they don't really consider just kind of on their own land, what they want to do. But if that's how every single person is in the entire watershed, then when you get to the bay, the bottom of where everything is being input, it's, it's going to be horrible quality. There's going to be dead zones. There's going to be dead fish. There's going to be horrible things going on. And that's what I try to explain to people. You have to kind of look at this as a whole, I don't even know how to exactly explain it, but it's a whole thing. It's not just what you're doing on your specific property alone. So many things are being impacted upstream that you may not consider in those high quality watersheds, um, just the tributary streams. So I think I try to always phrase it as if the person upstream is doing the buffer work, if they're actually stabilizing their banks, if they're not over applying fertilizer and actually monitoring what they're doing downstream, your animal, your crop, your water quality, everything is going to be so much better. So you have to look at it as a large scale versus kind of just in your little area. And I think once you kind of explain it that way, landowners kind of feel more almost, I guess, responsible for what's going on further down. Because a lot of the time you go out there and you're like, oh, I'm doing a Chesapeake Bay inspection. They're like, we're in Union County, Pennsylvania. Why do I care about that? So a lot of it's kind of just describing on how, as soon as those headwater streams are impacted, it's just going to go downhill from there. It's just going to make the ball roll and everything's going to be lower quality and just the degradation down the further down the line is going to be so strong if nobody's caring up in the headwater areas where we're at. Yeah, I would echo all of that. I think that's all incredible. And like the, the organization I worked for in New Hampshire had a lot of these catchphrases that related directly to this. Um, water knows no boundaries or, you know, healthy water, healthy communities. Some of these like advocacy and you know outreach um, slogans that really speak to that, and it's it's that same thing of you may have your own piece of property, you know where your property boundaries are, but the water that's flowing through it doesn't. It doesn't care about those boundaries. It's going to keep going until it gets to the ending point, which, as we're talking about in this case, the Chesapeake Bay. So um, it's really important to have those impacts be minimized upstream. Um, and then, you know, as Savannah said, it doesn't allow that ball to keep rolling and growing and getting bigger and bigger um, as it goes downstream. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, and it is hard to explain that sometimes scientifically to someone, but there's also truth to the fact that um, your water, you know, like some of the communities I worked with in New Hampshire, the water um, in that particular area wasn't the surface water in the streams wasn't drawn for drinking water, but further downstream it was. So there are people downstream of you that are drinking this water that eventually gets there. Um, and there's a lot of interaction between the surface water and the groundwater. So even if you have well water, um, you know, that could be impacting you as well. And I've, despite what someone may know about the environment or ecology, or maybe even have values towards that, I've rarely come across anyone who just doesn't care at all about clean water. I think clean water is something that pretty much everyone can kind of get behind as, you know, an important thing, something that they care about, something that they, as you said, Savannah, they would want for themselves. And so it's important to think about, you know, the communities and the people living downstream of you and upstream of you and what they're doing and how it impacts you. So. Yeah. I I have used some version of what you did, Savannah, in the past of, you know, think about who's downstream of you and upstream of you. And only once have I ever had a landowner say, well, I don't like my neighbor downstream. Oh. <laughs> That's when you struggle. <laughs> <laughs> but he got it, you know, it was a tongue in cheek, but, um, you know, it took me back a second. It was, it was well played. Um, but you know the fact that it, it's it's tough to find somebody who can't who has the ability to disagree with that speaks to how valuable it is as a way to explain it. Um, so I want to be conscious of time and start working through some questions. If anybody out there has uh, questions, feel free to post them in the chat. We'll get to as many as we can here. Um, we had a couple come in before the webinar tonight, uh, early. So. 
one of those I wanted to look at or talk about, uh, the first one was, does the Freshwater Research Institute collaborate with other colleges and universities? Um, I'll give the short answer to that as yes. And the long answer is more of a, we look for any opportunity we can to work with anyone who wants to move one, any one of these balls forward, any one of these metaphorical balls. Um, you know, we think about, uh, or at least I think about what do we want the streams to look like 10, 50, 100 years from now? What do we want communities to look like 10, 50, 100 years from now? And what are the questions we need answers to to decide how to get there? Um, and sure, we have specialty here in streams, but we don't have, you know, I lean so heavily on people like Savannah, the conservation districts, to know the landowners, to know the land even. Um, we work a lot with nonprofits like the Chesapeake Conservancy to you know, identify, they have a um, GIS, a, a spatial data mapping group that is just incredibly strong and, and really good at identifying where we should work. So we work with them to you know, combine those two things together in other schools where people are doing research that's related, but you know, maybe it's not being stitched together in a way that it could be to answer a bigger question. So we work a lot on trying to do that. Um, so I would say yes, and we're always looking for new friends. Um, what would you say, I'll pitch this to both of you and see how you feel about it. This is quite an open-ended one that we could probably spend more time than we should on. Uh, what would you say is the biggest indicator of health in a body of water? I guess um, I'll just kind of start on that. I think um, Trent will probably have more experience with it, um, just kind of the unassessed water uh, program that the Freshwater Research Initiative does. Um, all of the studies that they do based on water quality, um, there's measurements taken there. And then there is also just, I guess, kind of physical features, um, just kind of the banks, what they're looking like, what the sediment on the bottom of the stream looks like, um, if there is a lot of sediment pollution in the stream. And then we go on to do uh, electrofishing where we look at fish populations. And we've collected that data for I don't even know how many years at this point. So just kind of looking on how things have changed over time and also the macro invertebrate studies that we do, um, especially at Susquehanna, I don't really do quite as much. I'm sure Trent does now. Um, just kind of looking at the changes over time, um, how many species there are, um, just kind of the higher quality ones that you would see in headwater streams versus what you would see in an agricultural impacted stream. So I will let Trent take that, but just wanted to throw that one in there. Yeah, and it's, it's going to sound like a cop-out answer, but it's it's a combination of all these factors. Um, it's, you know, the physical chemical parameters that you take, um, but none of these things can be looked at by themselves to help you determine the quality of the water. Um, so you could look at the temperature, the oxygen levels, the pH, but you also need to combine that with the biological data that you get. So I remember a stream we surveyed this past summer where you know, there was a tributary flowing in that was providing um, acid mine drainage impacts. And so the pH was extremely low, um, pH meaning low acidity. And um, the moment we got above where that tributary was influencing the mainstream that we were serving, within one meter, we found a brook trout. Um, and so that's just kind of an anecdotal evidence to the fact that like these, these organisms, the fish, they know this stuff. They can sense when these changes are occurring in the environment and they know what's you know habit, um, what's an area that they can live in. So I like I love looking at macroinvertebrates um, because they're you know also indicator species, and so you get a sense of depending on which types you find, it allows you to determine um, is this are these organisms pollution tolerant, meaning do they tolerate a lot of pollution, and then therefore your life in a system that does have pollution or do they not? And so you can only find them in a, a higher quality system. So you look at really all those factors and everything is valuable, even the visible stuff, um, just the visual eye test, like Savannah was saying, what do the banks look like? 
Is there a lot of erosion? Um, what does the stream bottom look, out, look like? One of the things that we do um, with at WPC is we do visual assessment, which is literally just going out to a watershed, getting boots on the ground and walking the stream. We'll just walk miles every day of the stream and just visually assess it. What does it look like? Um, where are there potential problems that we see? Are there barriers to organisms moving? Things like that. So there's a ton of things and in combination together, they all kind of help determine the quality. Uh, I, I'm resisting the urge to pull out a whiteboard right now because the way that I often think about this is a you know, three-way Venn diagram of chemical, physical, and biological. Uh, and, and how you define health sort of depends on which one of those matters the most in that moment. And, or somewhere in between all of them in that central concentric triangular Venn thing that I don't quite know the ge geometric name for. Um, uh, I think it really matters if you're, if you're talking about health of a body of water as in terms of whether or not someone can drink it. You know, maybe we're talking about cyanobacteria, we're talking about nitrates, we're talking about heavy metals. It sort of depends on the land use then too, right? So yeah, I, I'm gonna go with Trent's answer too on the cop outside and say it, it depends. Um, but in the right con or in different contexts, there may be easy answers to give. It's just not one that sweeps across all of them. Okay. Um, so this one is probably leaning to more toward Trent. Um, and if you want to pass on any of this, feel free to pass it my way because I love muscles too. But somebody has just wanted to know, you know, more about muscles. You sh there was a photo of you, or I think it was Eric with all the muscles on the table. Um, you know, most people I don't think, or at least I didn't until I started working with them, think about how many muscles there are in streams and that they're not clams. That they have a completely different life cycle. Um, if you wanna talk any about how muscles are amazing or you know, what you've learned working with them. Yeah, working with muscles has been incredible because it's really new for me. Um, you know, obviously, like most people, I have eaten a muscle at some point in my life, um, one that comes from the ocean. Um, but uh, working with freshwater mussels is very different. And I, the question I see talks also about, um, you know, seeing so many of them. And I'm wondering, you know, I would, I would wonder if those are small or large. Um, a lot of the small clams that we see in our streams and rivers are unfortunately an invasive species known as the Asiatic clam. Um, the freshwater mussels that we survey for at, the, at WPC are usually larger and they're native species. Um, and so it's really incredible. What they do is they burrow into the bottom of the stream bed um, and they filter the water. So they're actively cleaning water. Um, and the way they I won't go on a tangent. The way they, they reproduce is really interesting as well. And they're just very fascinating species. Um, so what we, we get to do scuba diving and snorkeling to survey for mussel populations um, to sort of determine, again, the health of the stream. It's another indicator species. Um, so the presence of mussels indicates some level of clean water, um, the presence of native mussels, I should say. Um, and then again, diversity, how many species are there? How many are there in numbers? Um, so that's a little bit about, about muscles. Matt, if you want to add more, you, please feel free to. You probably have a lot more experience in that. Oh, do I? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I think you hit a lot of good points, Trent. And I too am going to avoid going too far into the life cycle rabbit hole because that is just so much fun. For those of you who don't know, quickly, uh, freshwater mussels actually use a they have a larval stage that kind of looks like a pac-man with teeth and they create this lure out of one of their body parts the physical anatomy that they send out of their shell that looks like a small fish swimming and so a larger fish will come by and grab that lure and they send their glochidia the babies all these tiny pac-man up into the gills of the fish hold on to the fish and then the fish swims away and that's how they transport their babies throughout a water system so they don't move much, but their babies move really far. And it's all thanks to the fish. Um, 
The other thing I was going to say too is some species mussels can be incredibly long-lived. So we have ones, uh, especially in the Susquehanna and Delaware, that the most common species now, or used to be the most common species, now pretty rare, uses eels only as their host, and they can live for over 100 years. So you might still see a lot of them out in the river, but all the ones you see are over 100 years old. Uh, until they started restocking eels upstream of the dams 100 or 10 years ago. And we have started to see recruitment of babies again, which is really wonderful. Getting more to the, the point of a um, question somebody else had about dams. You know, in terms of the fish we have on the East Coast, it affects eels who want to swim upstream as babies, and they don't have much strength for that. Um, and then, but I think the biggest issue is the mussels. You know, we don't have these fish that are the hosts of the mussels that keep those water filters um, in play. So that's the critical point on my side. Um, well, I'm looking at time here and I wanted to say, do either of you have any final thoughts or, or questions you want to go back to, things you want to say before we wrap up? Just to touch on the eel thing, which I think is super cool. When I was working um, with the Susquehanna River Basin Commission, we actually, I want to say it was with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, went out and actually did an eel survey. So they have these little pit tags in them. So we electroshocked and collected a bunch of them, and then we could actually see how much they grew over time. So these restocking programs are really awesome. They're very successful in what I've seen so far. Um, we've even, I've seen some in Penn's Creek, not many, but there's some there, which is super awesome. So we can hope that someday our populations of both eels and anything else mollusks would come back. So that's great. Yeah. And I will also add that a lot of what we've been talking about recently falls into the category of aquatic organism passage or AOP is how we like to um, abbreviate it. And that's a lot of some of the work I'm doing at uh, with Western Pennsylvania Conservancy too, whether it's looking at culverts um, that are poorly designed and don't allow fish to travel upstream. Um, any Anytime there's a road that crosses the stream, there has to be some structure there that allows the stream to keep going. Um, and so we do a lot of culvert removals or even dam removals. And that speaks to some of what Savannah was saying earlier about seeing the immediate impact. Um, we have had dam removal projects where the moment the structure is out, there are fish just waiting there in the stream and they immediately swim upstream. It's like it's like the most immediate gratification you can possibly get for work that you're doing. Um, and it's incredible because you really are reconnecting miles of stream um, until you may hit another barrier. Um, and with the mussels too, um, our senior aquatic science director, Eric Chapman, is, is working on a silo project where he has actually taken baby mussels grown in a hatchery, um, placing them into streams where we have found native mussels and then essentially studying how well they do, how, what's their survivability and what's their growth rate. And therefore we can determine which streams we can stock more mussels into. So a lot of the mussel work is really cutting edge. Um, these are systems that maybe were surveyed back in like the 1930s at some point and there's a record of you know somebody finding no mussels there. Um, we have records now um, of finding mussel populations there. So the populations are coming back and by putting more mussels into these streams, we may get much larger, more robust populations too. So it's a little bit more on the mussel corner, but. You know, really flexing a little bit there. Um, sorry, I, I, I can't stop the mussel jokes, but <laughs> I just wanted to say that's a, a wonderfully positive note to end on tonight. And I wanna thank you both for joining us. Um, so this, for those of you who are out there watching, this is the first session of the alumni speaker series this academic year. And our next session will be on Tuesday, October 11th at 7 p.m. to talk about what's at stake with the November elections. Uh, any of the upcoming events, so you two might be interested if you're close enough, but we have a happy hour and brewery tour at Wolf Brewing in Mechanicsburg on September 22nd. Uh, cornucopia brunch cruise out of Perth Amboy, New Jersey on the 25th. Nationals and Phillies uh, uh, on October 1st. And brunch at Narci oh, Narcissi Winery outside of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh on the 8th. So that might be in your neck of the woods, <laughs> Um 
And of course, family weekend, September 30th and October 1st and homecoming October 28th and 29th. So maybe I will see one of the two of you or perhaps both in the future for something that isn't work related. Yes, right. that sounds still fun. <laughs> both are fun. <laughs> wow, that was a lot more fun for the um, the work side. Than... It's always I'm, I'm fun. Okay with that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> It is definitely fun crawling through a stream when it's 100 degrees out. You know? Exactly. It could be better. And at partnership meetings, it's always fun. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you both. Um, that is all I have. If you have any final thoughts, Susan, I'll turn it over to you. No final thoughts. Thank you so much for a very informative and entertaining session. Have a good night, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you.